After eight years of war, could Yemen really be on the brink of peace? We're the first foreign journalists inside Yemen since Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two regional powers who fueled this war, agreed to renew diplomatic ties. And we bring you a series of exclusive reports from across the country. This conflict's often called the world's forgotten war. Unlike what's happening in Ukraine, this brutal civil war has raged here for almost a decade, and much of it without the world's attention, despite it plunging tens of millions of people into the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And worst of all, it is a totally avoidable man-made catastrophe. One of the main reasons for this disaster is because of the difficulty getting into the country so that we can tell you what's happening here. But we've got rare access inside Yemen, and we can tell you there is not a corner of this extraordinary place which hasn't been impacted by conflict. Over the last two weeks, me and my Sky News team have travelled hundreds of kilometres across Yemen, from the devastated, divided city of Taz to the west coast, where hundreds of thousands have fled fighting, and to here and the port city of Aden. In this special programme, we have astonishing evidence of how corruption, greed and desperation have led to food aid being bought and sold just to survive, whilst thousands starve to death. This is an image which should shame. She's the face of hunger in Yemen's forgotten war. Her name is Ahad and she's three years old, but weighs less than an average newborn. She is slowly starving to death, and the medics in this remote basic clinic can't seem to save her. Whatever food we give her, her father says, she keeps throwing it up. She can't keep it down. Her father's brought her in for more checks. Ahad also has Down syndrome, which the medics here have rarely seen before. The checks confirm what's painfully obvious. Ahad is raising red flags with every measurement. But the nearest hospital is around 60 kilometers away, and it'll cost $16 for transport, way beyond their means. She won't be going. And there are tens of thousands of children like Ahad in Yemen, also starving and poor. <laughs> Yemen's eight-year-long war has caused millions to flee their homes to camps like Al Jasha on the west coast. It's one of the biggest, with nearly 9,000 people all living here from hand to mouth, where everyone seems to be hungry. Within seconds of arriving, we were surrounded by people begging for food and help. We don't even have a morsel, not a bit of rice to eat, he says. We have nothing. We are suffocating here. We are dying. The camp is a dusty, sprawling community where the war is never far away and where the arrival of a new baby means just another mouth to feed in the midst of a conflict which has left them homeless. There is war all around us, she says. It's really scary and it's raining bullets. So how can we go home? Where can we go? Our presence here has attracted a big crowd from the camp. They keep telling us that they want aid. And there's a lot of people pushing and shoving. We keep telling them we're not an aid agency, we're just journalists, but they're not listening. Yemen's enduring one of the world's worst humanitarian disasters, and these are the people who are trying to survive it. The Khokha market nearby is packed with people trying to find a way to eat and we find evidence of shopkeepers selling food aid. This is quite clearly World Food Programme, it says on it, and also not for sale. He says it was the cheapest he could find. He agrees to lead us to the store he bought it from, but says there are plenty more selling food aid. The shopkeeper seems very camera shy at first. Uh, have, you, have you got any other World Food Programme um, aid here? He initially denies he's got any more food aid he's selling in the store. No, not here, he says. 
and then tries to hide a WFP packet in front of him. But with our camera rolling, he realizes it's a tough claim to pull off and finally hands the food packet to me. Remember, this food is donated free and meant for the most needy. Yeah, World Food Programme again. He's got a whole load of those. Excuse out of the way, please. Look at them all under there. There's a whole pile of them underneath the counter, all from World Food Programme. How much are you selling these for, sir? He's making 700 rials, or 70 cents a packet. 700. Do you know this is not meant to be sold? Yes, he nods. He knows he's not meant to be selling donated goods. Why are you selling it then? He's worried now and says he's going to stop selling food aid from today. But looking around his store, it's packed with sacks of rice and flour, which have also come from international donors. But he insists he's providing a service. People sell their food aid out of desperation, he says. For example, if someone wants to buy medicine, they sell the aid to me so they can afford the medicine. It's in an emergency. But the small baby clinic in Khoja, run mostly by volunteers, is packed with babies and mothers who urgently need food they cannot afford. Seven-month-old Sarah is the youngest of seven. All of them are hungry, but the baby is suffering most. The doctor fears the worst if she isn't taken to hospital. There'll be complications if she doesn't go, he says, and if there are complications, she'll die for sure. The doctors say Sarah needs urgent help, but her mother can't afford the fare to the hospital, so won't go. Urgent doesn't come in reals or dollars, and Fatima has six other children to feed. These are choices no mother wants to make. Sarah's fate now seems horribly sealed. She's another young victim in Yemen's man-made humanitarian catastrophe. That is the tragedy unfolding in just one area of Yemen. Across the country, there are similar tales of despair and desperation. In a moment, we'll take you to the heart of this horrific conflict and the city of Taz, once Yemen's capital of culture, now a place where sniper fire, rockets and unexploded bombs kill and maim women and children every day. So how did Yemen find itself in this catastrophic situation? And just how severe is this crisis? Well, the war in Yemen has been going on for eight long years. The latest UN estimates suggest 227,000 people have died in this war. Most of those deaths are from the indirect consequences of the war. Widespread famine, diseases like cholera and a lack of health infrastructure. The war is being fought between, on the one hand, Houthi rebels who are backed by Iran and have taken control of the north of the country, including the capital, Sana'a and Yemen's former government, which is backed by a Saudi-led coalition that includes the US and UK. Both sides have been accused of war crimes by multiple human rights groups. We've travelled to the front lines in Taz, in the south of the country, emblematic of the divisions and disaster here, to show you what life is like for those living in a city under siege. We're given a two-vehicle government army escort to head towards the besieged city of Taz. It's been split in two for most of the past eight years of war, with most key roads into and out blocked off by fighting. It's meant a uniquely slow torture for the Taz civilians, with the Houthi militia held to one half of the city by government troops who control the other. The city has been blasted to bits in places, with booby trap bombs buried in gardens by the retreating fighters and mines hidden in kitchen ovens to blow up any returning residents. They've been planted down alleyways and left in the piles of rubble and rubbish. The siege has brought parts of Taz to the brink of starvation, yet families are still living here. Mohammed shows us round the bombed-out shopping centre, which is now his home. His family's living in the basement. A lot of damage to every floor that we've visited so far. A lot of hits on just this building alone. Over there is one of the Houthi bases, Mohammed tells us. It's by the old presidential palace. It's from there snipers pick off civilians or fire rockets. Three of Mohammed's children were born in this siege. 
They all show signs of malnutrition and spend most of their lives inside. Of course I worry about them, Mohammed says. This isn't a safe place. I don't let them go outside on their own in case there are rockets or anything. Neither children nor pensioners are safe. Kaba was shot in the back by a sniper. Her home is right on the front line and she refuses to be pushed out. I refuse to leave my house, she tells us. I refuse to. The Houthis would shout at me, crazy woman, leave your house, but I will never, ever leave. The war has never let up in Taz, and whilst there's increasing optimism about a negotiated settlement for the country, those hopes seem to have halted at the gates of this city. Just to give you an idea of how close they all are living to the front line, at the end of that road is where the fighting is, no man's land, and dozens of families are living in this area. And they've had to put up sheets to try and obscure the view of the sniper who has positioned himself just beyond there. It means constant exchanges between the warring groups. <laughs> We're defending our land and our families, one tells us. <laughs> we want peace, another says, but they don't want it. They're killing innocent people and children, and that's why we carry weapons. This intransigence has led to one of the world's worst humanitarian disasters, with starvation, poverty and disease in the hospital wards, homes and streets of Yemen. <coughs> Three-month-old Ayad is holding on to life by a thread, the youngest of six who've all had the same battle to survive in a country where her mother has to choose between food or medicine when she can pay for neither. My daughter was very weak and we needed to take her to the hospital, she explains. But we didn't have the money, so we had to wait to try to get some, and by then she was unconscious. Those like Fatima want justice too. The mother of nine knows more than most about loss. They were kids, not fighters. She's talking about her children. Four of them were blown up in one day. Three were killed outright. The fourth, only a toddler, lost a leg. <laughs> Photos of their mutilated bodies are all she's left of her babies. <laughs> and she's praying for revenge for their violent deaths. <laughs> she's compiled a file with their details and wants to track down those who fired the mortar shell that killed them as they were playing outside their home. Nothing can ever replace my children, she says. Leila, Hamid and Mahmoud, they'll never come back. Look at these pictures, she keeps saying to us. They're just children. She's pregnant again, but would have aborted if doctors had agreed. She doesn't want to bring another child into this war-torn place. She can't feed those she still has. Her two-year-old Malik has sweet tea with yesterday's bread. It's her first and only meal of the day. The tragic daily struggles there for families living under siege in the city of Taz. One of the many tragedies of this war is that the last 12 months were supposed to be a real opportunity for peace in Yemen. A truce signed between the Houthi rebels and the government forces should have ended the fighting and laid the groundwork for talks between the rival parties. And although there is some hope for the future, civilians are still being killed and injured daily often by mines deliberately left behind by the Houthi rebels, and that is a potential war crime under international law. So too are the thousands and thousands of airstrikes by the Saudi-led coalition which have targeted schools, markets, homes, and many of these victims are children. It is an horrific and heartbreaking legacy of war. Uh. The talk of peace in Yemen doesn't drown out the cries of the war victims. Oh, yeah, no. Hatab's still a teenager, but he's lost both his hands and his sight and all hope for a better future now. His body is peppered with shrapnel wounds, many still lodged in his chest. He doesn't seem aware of how severe his injuries are, 
and he won't be able to get the specialist help he so urgently needs inside Yemen. His father appeals to us to get his son medical help. He needs to go out of Yemen, he tells us. He's a human. There are lots like him, but look how he's suffering. They can't make artificial limbs quickly enough to cope with the growing number of amputees who need them now. But creating prosthetic legs are easy in comparison to electronic hands, which are very expensive, so they mostly do cosmetic arms. This only for cosmetic, not for... Not only a cosmetic hand? Yeah, yeah. No, not, it doesn't move? Not functional at all. Mm, it this, doesn't do anything? Yeah, it doesn't do anything. Many of the amputees are children. There's a whole generation like Abdullah growing up maimed and mutilated by this long war. Most of Abdullah's 10 years have been spent living in this war zone. He still has ambitions to be a footballer and is a Taekwondo enthusiast. But his life's going to be tough and anti-explosive teams know he won't be the last to suffer. How can I help my family and friends, Abdullah asks. He doesn't want them to go through the same pain. You can tell them if they see anything suspicious, do not touch it, do not touch anything. Anaya lost her leg during what was meant to be an agreed truce between the fighting groups. The 13-year-old has learned how wartime agreements are no agreements at all in Yemen. She shows us on her good leg how doctors had to cut more and more of her wounded limb to stave off infection, which still hasn't healed seven months after the explosion. Her family's traumatized about the day she got blown up by a landmine left in the street. Anaya's since dropped out of school and says she's no friends now either, but she still has dreams to get justice for war crimes. My dream is to be a lawyer, she tells us. I was thinking I'd learn English and I want to study to be a lawyer so I can fight and defend those who need it. But first she's got her own fight on her hands, to heal, and every five days she comes here to get her wound cleaned. It's a constant tussle between nurse and patient. Keep your hand away, he says. Don't tell me what to do, she screams. Don't do that, he says. He's worried about more infection. It hurts, it hurts, Anaya sobs. It's acutely painful, and she's had seven months of this pain. It's turned into a regular battle of wills. But they are the best of friends. Few believe she'll be the last of Yemen's war wounded, or it's really nearing an end. No, it's not. We're still in the middle of the war. No, no peace is coming. It's depressing. Yeah, we're depressed here. Everybody's depressed. Yeah. There's still much insecurity here, despite a recent lull in fighting nationwide. The whole of Taz seems like it's one big minefield sometimes, with civilians living right in the middle of it all. There is a small Yemeni team tasked with clearing, but their international funding's been slashed as aids diverted to conflicts like Ukraine. Often, they can't even afford the paint to show a path's been checked. The Halo Trust, which gets some British funds, is now inside the city. And one of its priorities is warning children of the dangers of unexploded ordnance. Many of the homes here are incubating explosives which have yet to detonate. And the Halo Trust will assess the risks and aim to remove what they can, starting in the next few weeks. There is a constant threat in this particular neighbourhood of items being fired from that front line. Um, I believe yesterday was the latest incident. There was a mortar which was fired slightly further down in Dawa. This war has torn apart lives and torn off limbs, and the options are very limited for survivors like 10-year-old Nada and her older sister. Nada's considered lucky because she has an artificial hand, which she struggles to put on to show off to us. When she finally manages it, it's quickly apparent it is more of a hindrance to her. When I push my arm inside, it feels painful, she says, when my bone touches the artificial bit. 
It's less than six months since her arm was blown off and her new artificial limb is already broken and utterly useless. Nadia tells us she wanted to be a doctor, but she doesn't think she'll be able to now with just one hand. So she's aiming to study to be a mind clearer. I don't want others to be affected like I have and to go through what happened to me, she says. That's why I tell my siblings I'm going to be a mind clearance woman. And not one of us who hears her doubts she'll do exactly that. There isn't a single person in this country who hasn't been affected by this war. And as it grinds on and on, more and more Yemenis are demanding an end to the fighting and calling for peace. But the space for these voices is being eradicated, with the authorities on both sides clamping down on dissent. Journalists, YouTubers, women's rights activists are all facing prison, torture, even execution just for speaking their minds. We've managed to get access to some of those at the forefront of this battle as they risk everything to demand an end to the human rights crackdown. The war is suspended for a time inside these art classes. Here they can express themselves in a way which is a lot more problematic outside. They paint their dreams and their fears. But the themes of killing, violence and oppression are ever present. <laughs> I drew myself in space, away from all the suffering where we are on Earth, she told us. The painting shows her looking out of a window to a new peaceful world. But outside these walls, people on both sides of this conflict have told us of serious violations of human rights. The four men in the cage are YouTubers, social media bloggers who criticize the Houthi rebels in control in the north, calling them greedy and corrupt. The Houthis made sure their court appearance was broadcast on the channels they control. The YouTubers were jailed for between six months and three years after being found guilty of inciting chaos and spreading false information. Four journalists are still in jail and facing execution eight years after being accused of fake news and spying by the Houthis. Another journalist in the same jail told us he saw them being tortured, and he was too. The war has meant Yemen is becoming more and more of a man's world, with them holding all the power. Women living in the shadow of all these guns told us of mounting worries and an increasing lack of freedoms. Every single woman here working or getting outside, she's suffering, she's struggling, she's facing too many difficulties, so she can get away or get out of her home just to face the society in the street every single morning. Another said she'd been bullied and threatened online after posting a picture with a man, her husband. There was a lot of anger from everyone, she told us. Posts were sent to me full of violence. There was even a campaign by religious figures, but also from journalists. There was very little acceptance that a woman and man should be sharing these kinds of pictures, she told us. Singers like this young woman are discouraged, derided and mocked. Right now in this war, she says, everything's really tough for us Yemeni artists. There are loads of things which make it hard for us women to sing. There's resistance from our families. It's against our customs and against our traditions. So Yemeni artists face a lot of problems. A model who posted videos on TikTok and Instagram is now facing five years in a Houthi jail. Her Instagram pictures without a hijab caused outrage amongst the Houthi de facto authorities. She was accused of immoral behavior, committing indecent acts and drug possession. The 20-year-old's jailing has caused shock inside Yemen and beyond and underscored the huge challenge of restoring human rights in the country. The brave women and men there refusing to be silenced despite the risks. Well, the recent restoring of diplomatic ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia has brought us closer to possible peace than ever before. But the challenges which remain are considerable. 
international aid is being slashed, placing even more Yemeni lives at risk. The legacy of unexploded ordnance threatens hundreds of thousands of civilians. And the proliferation of weapons amongst armed groups means there is still so much that needs to be done before this country can ever see an end to war. We've tried to bring you as rounded a picture as possible of what life is like right now for Yemenis. And not just their hopes for peace, but their need for accountability to bring those responsible for war crimes and human rights abuses to justice one day. Our Sky News team on the ground here in Yemen includes cameraman Jake Britton, who brought you those staggering images, Middle East editor Zain Jafar and our Yemeni producer Ahmed Baida. And big thanks and much respect to the dozens and dozens of Yemeni civilians who let us tell their stories, often at risk to themselves. Thanks for watching. Time for a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Further blustery showers are on the cards, but it will turn colder from Sunday as a northerly wind brings the return of overnight frosts. There will be scattered showers this evening, some heavy with a risk of hail and thunder accompanied by gusty winds in the south. Longer spells of rain will affect parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. It stays breezy tonight with showers or longer spells of rain. The showers could turn wintry over the Scottish hills with an increasing risk of snow. Saturday brings another day of sunny spells and showers, heaviest and most frequent in the north, and they're going to be wintry over the hills. An area of more persistent rain, heavy at times, will spread into southern Ireland and into southwest England by the evening. Overnight rain will clear southwards on Sunday morning to leave sunny spells, wintry showers and a risk of snow and ice in the north. It will feel cold with a marked wind chill. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. This is Sky News Tonight. Coming up in the next hour, violent protests force the postponement of the King's state visit to France. Emmanuel Macron said common sense and friendship led to the decision. He's described it as detestable. The King had been scheduled to arrive in France this Sunday. It was his first state visit as a monarch. We'll have all the latest up next.